introduce myself for the sake of the video. Um, my name is Catherine Sutton, and I'm coming from Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia. And uh, I want to thank the philosophy department and the Virginia Philosophical Society and the Dean's Office for the invitation um, to talk here today. My topic is, can two things exist in the same place at the same time? And uh, this question, for the most part, has a pretty obvious answer, no. They can't, right? So you and I can't occupy the same bus seat, for example. Right? One of us is going to have to uh, stand up. Um, but I'm going to argue that there are special cases where we can have two things that occupy exactly the same space at exactly the same time. Um, so one way to ask this question is, how can we tell if two names, X and Y, refer to two things or only one. And so thinking about it in terms, let's think about this in terms of how do we count objects. Right? So um, we, there's lots of cases where we have two names for one thing. So for example, um, Jorge Bergoglio and Pope Francis refer to one person, not two. Okay. So there's a philosopher named Leibniz in the 1700s who came up with a test to help us tell whether we have one object or two objects that we're dealing with. And this is how his test worked. He said, what we need to do is we need to compare the properties or the attributes or characteristics that go along with each name and see if those properties are the same properties or characteristics or attributes. And if they, if they are, we're dealing with one thing. If they're not, we have evidence that we're dealing with two. Right, so here's Leibniz's test. If X and Y have all of the same properties, then X is identical to Y. And saying that X is identical to Y is just another way of saying um, that X and Y are two names for one thing. Okay. If, on the other hand, X has different properties than Y does, then X is not identical to Y, which is another way of saying we have two things, not one. Right. Now, two things might overlap. Um, so, for example, you are not identical to your arm. You and your arm are two things, but they overlap. That's okay. Um, so, they might have two things might have a lot of properties in common, but we just need to find one one difference in properties, and there we have evidence of two objects. All right. So, let's take an example. So, uh, some of you might remember last year there was a book published called Cuckoo's Calling by a new author, Robert Galbraith. And the critics said, uh, some critics said, well, this is a really good novel for a first novel. Um, the bio on the back said he was an ex-military man and uh, didn't have a background in writing. Well, there was a journalist who got a tip, an anonymous tip via Twitter, that Robert Galbraith was a pen name for J.K. Rowling. So Robert Gilbraith is the same person as J.K. Rowling. Well, being a good journalist, he didn't want to just take an anonymous Twitter tip and publish that. So he started doing his homework, and he used Leibniz's test. And he started looking for properties of or characteristics of Robert Gilbraith, other than the fake bio on the back, um, that he could then compare to the characteristics or properties of Rowling. And this is what he found out. So let's make two columns, one for each, and we'll compare them. All right, so one thing he found out about Robert Galbraith was that his agent was a man named Christopher Little. Little. And it turns out that's the same agent, whoop, that's the same agent that represents J.K. Rowling. Then he started looking at the contents of uh, Robert Galbraith's novel and comparing it to uh, J.K. Rowling's first novel written for adults. So after that Harry Potter series, she had published um, a, a novel for adult audiences. And he found that in um, Galbraith's writing, there were Latin phrases that showed up a lot, which turns out to be a signature style of Rowling as well. Right? Um, also, both novels had passages about drug use. So um, now, using Leibniz's test, we would have to compare all of the properties of Galbraith and Rowling. 
which um, would take a very, very, very long time and we would never finish that task. Uh, so what the journalist did was he said, well, I feel like I have enough to go on. And he took, he took the two uh, books and sent them off to a linguist who had developed software to, to compare writing styles. And the linguist wrote back and said, well, they're, they're probably the same writer. I can't be 100% certain, but they probably are. So um, the journalist wrote to the publisher and said, I have some evidence that Gail, Gail Braith is Rowling. Can you confirm? And they, they wrote back and said yes. Right? So, um, but Linus' test helped, helped the journalist get started. All right, let's consider another case. And this is the kind of case that you might be um, familiar with from your everyday life. So maybe you have, uh, have you ever had a conversation with someone and you mention a friend, um, let's say, oh, my friend Brittany, so-and-so, um, and the person you're talking to says, oh, I have a friend named Brittany too. I wonder if it's the same person. And you might want to figure out, um, using Leibniz's test, whether, um, so let's, let's ask, is your friend Brittany the same person as my friend Britt? And again, we'll make a column for each and compare their properties. So it turns out Brittany's a sophomore here, and so is, is my friend Britt. They both grew up in upstate New York, right? So maybe, uh, maybe they will be the same person. Um, Brittany was at the party last weekend, and so was Britt. And you tell me, well, Brittany runs track, and she's very good. She's really passionate about it. Well, my friend Britt hates to run. And she wouldn't run track if her life depended on it. So we have a property, a difference in property, properties that gives us evidence that Brittany and Britt are not, in fact, the same person, right? So, um, and all it takes is one difference in properties, one different, one difference uh, between the two lists of properties for us to say these are two different people or two different objects. All right, so now let's use Leibniz's test to look at a case where we might have two objects in the same place at the same time. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to imagine that you have a lump of clay. Here's, here's your lump of clay, right? One object or two. Clearly, it seems pretty clear we have one object here, a lump of clay. And um, looks like by this picture, uh, you also have some cool plaid pants. But we're going to focus on the clay um, for the purposes of our philosophical <coughs> example. All right, so now imagine you sculpt the clay into a statue. You're pretty good. All right, so um, you now have a new object, a statue. Now let's go back to our question. Are we dealing with one object or two? Well, we have this new object, the statue, but it seems like the lump of clay is still there. Nothing happened to it. What does it mean to be a lump of clay? Well, a lump of clay is just some clay that's stuck together, and as long as we have the same clay stuck together in the same quantity, then it's the same lump. So it doesn't matter if our lump of clay is shaped like a ball, if it's, it's shaped like a pancake or a square or a statue. Right? So um, it seems like in this case, the lump of clay was not destroyed, it's still around, but with a new shape. So let's run Leibniz's test to see if uh, the lump of clay and the statue are two names for the same thing, or whether we can find a difference in properties that would suggest that we're dealing with two objects here. So um, once again, uh, we're going to use Leibniz's test and make a column for each. Now notice when we're making the column for each, the lump, I'm going to use the same picture for the lump and the statue because the lump at this point is shaped like a statue. And we know that the lump and the statue, if they do turn out to be two objects, have a lot of properties in common. They're located in the same place, they have the same shape, um, they, they weigh the same amount, right? Um, so if they're are property differences, they're going to be, um, they probably will be fewer than the property similarities. All right, so um, here's one property that the lump has. It could survive being flattened. Right? So as we talked about before, it could be reshaped into a ball, it could be flattened like a pan.
pancake, it's still the same lump. But the statue could not survive being flattened. If we take that clay and roll it back into a ball, we've destroyed the statue. We, we no longer have a statue. Okay? So here's one property difference that gives us some evidence that we're dealing with two objects. And um, by the way, let me uh, talk a little bit about why Leibniz's test works. Right? So, why, why is it that having different properties gives us, gives us evidence that there are two objects? Um, and this goes back to the Greek philosopher Aristotle. He had a famous principle he called the principle of non-contradiction. And that principle tells us that one object cannot have contradictory properties. So one object, so for example, you couldn't have brown eyes and not have brown eyes at the same time in the same way. Right? So if we're dealing with one object here, that one single object couldn't both have the property of, be, of being able to survive a flattening and also at the same time have the contradictory property of not being able to survive being flattened. Let's look at one, one more property difference. The lump could not be hollowed out or else it would be a different, smaller lump. Right? So we talked about what it is to be a lump is to be a certain amount of clay that's stuck together. So if we hollow this object out, um, if we hollow out the lump, we will destroy the lump and bring into existence a new smaller lump of clay. But the statue, on the other hand, it seems like the statue could be hollowed out because what it is to be a statue is to have certain aesthetic properties and it would look exactly the same. Right? So you could... Um, Hollow it out, take a picture, it's the same thing. Um, you might sell it to a buyer. They're not going to care if it's hollowed out in the middle. Right? So again, we have another difference in properties between the lump and the statue. One could survive being hollowed out, the other one couldn't. Right? So this property difference gives us the evidence that we need to conclude that there's two objects here because we have two sets of properties even though these objects are located in the same place at the same time, and are made up of the same stuff, the same molecules of clay. This is a good time to ask, who cares? Uh, is, there one, is there one thing there? Is there a statue in the lump um, that are two things? Or are they two names for the same thing? Who cares? All right, let me give you a couple of um, reasons. All right, the first one is from the Greek philosopher Aristotle who said that human beings by nature desire to know. And what he's saying here is just that we are innately curious and we like to know about the world around us. And it might turn out that for, at least for some of us, this is something that we're innately curious about. Um, when we make a list of everything that exists in the world, should we write um, the lump on one line and the statue on, the, on another line? Or are we only dealing with one thing? But some of you might say, well, I'm innately curious about other things. So let me give you another motivation um, for why this question is of interest to people. All right, the lump and the statue are a similar case of, of having two objects existing in the same place at the same time. But there's another candidate that's a little bit closer to home. Right? You and your body might be another case where we have two objects existing in the same place at the same time. Right? And um, so it becomes a little bit more personal. The question becomes a little bit more personal. Is my body just one thing and that's everything there is about me? Or am I something, um, is there some, something about me that makes me different in some way um, than my body? Now, uh, an important question before we proceed is, well, what do we mean by you? What do we mean by you? And here I'm going to draw on a traditional answer to this question um, that was made famous by French philosopher René Descartes. Um, and I'll let you finish his quote. Descartes was the one who said, um, I think, therefore, I am. Very good. So um, Descartes said what, that we are thinking things. We are thinking things. Uh, another philosopher named John Locke came along after Descartes, and um, he also talked about what does it mean to be you. 
And he, he said, one way to think about what it is to be you is to think about sort of these strange um, you know, fantasy scenarios of body switching. So um, let's, let's think about, um, imagine a case where you switch bodies with the President of the United States. So, and let's imagine that um, you have been studying hard, you earned an A in your art history class, you made the dean's list. Now, if I want to congratulate you on your hard work, and I want to ask you some questions about art history and draw on your new knowledge, um, and I know that you and the president have switched bodies, then who should I go and ask about art history? And Locke says, well, I should go and find the person who looks like the president of the United, the body that looks like the president of the United States, if I want to get some um, information about art history, and congratulate you on your uh, on your GPA. On the other hand, who should we wake up for a middle of the night briefing on Crimea? And Locke says we should wake up the uh, the body that looks that looks like you, but has the memories and thoughts and knowledge of the president. Um, and so the idea here is that what makes you you is your memories, your beliefs, your plans, your likes, your dislikes, and all of these psychological and mental features of you is um, that you're going to go wherever those mental, wherever that mental activity goes. So if that mental activity goes into the body of the president, then that's where you are. All right, so um, we'll, you, we're going to do Leibniz's test again with your body and you. And um, by you, we mean a person, a thinking, psychological being. All right, so here's our, our two columns. All right, so here's a property that your body has. Your body might exist an hour after your death. So imagine someone who dies in a hospital, an hour after that person dies, their body might still be in the hospital bed. Okay. And let's compare that to you. Okay. You might not exist an hour after your death. Okay. Now, you might say, well, I believe in an afterlife. And if you believe in an afterlife, you're still going to have a property difference because um, if you do exist in an afterlife, an hour after your death, um, for most people who believe in an afterlife, they don't think that that afterlife happens inside of a corpse. Right? So, um, so you could say, so the property difference is either going to be that even though your body exists in that hospital, um, you as a person don't exist at all, or um, even though the body exists in the hospital bed, um, you exist, but you exist somewhere other than in that hospital bed. Right? Maybe in heaven, or as a resurrected body, or something like that. All right, let's move on to a, a less morbid example. Um, how many of you have seen uh, the Freaky Friday movie, or you're familiar with the premise of the Freaky Friday story? All right, so a mother and her daughter switch bodies. All right, so. Um, Let's imagine that you're in a Freaky Friday case. Right. So, in that kind of a case, you would see the world from your mother's eyes very literally, right? Um, so, uh, in contrast, your body would still see the world through its own eyes, but your body would think like your mother. Right. So, again, we have an, a property difference between your body and you. Let's uh, look at a third case. Right, so um, transplants, there's been a lot of uh, progress in, uh, in medical transplantation over the last years. So first there were hand transplants. Um, more recently there have been face transplants. Right, so let's imagine that in some time in the future it becomes possible to do brain transplants. Now let's imagine that you undergo a brain transplant. And um, what, would, what would be true about your body in that case? If brain transplants became possible and your brain were transplanted, um, your body would be 
an empty shell of a person. But what would happen to you as a person? Well, it seems like if you, if your brain were taken out of your soul <coughs> and put into a different body, then um, you might wake up and find yourself in a new body. Right? So if brain transplants become possible and your brain were transplanted, you as a person could end up in a new body. Now your body could never end up in a new body. Right? That wouldn't make sense. So, um, so again, we have a difference in properties between your body and you, which gives us evidence that you and your body are two different things. Um, now, let me, say, uh, let me say something about souls at this point. So you might think that you are, as a person, that what it is to be you is to be a non-physical soul. Now, if you hold that view, then you would still have these property differences between you and your body, but on a traditional understanding of souls as non-physical things, it might not, you wouldn't be a case of two objects in the same place at the same time. Because if souls are non-physical, then um, tradi the traditional understanding is that non-physical things don't take up space, and so they're not located anywhere. Uh, there's been, uh, just a few years ago, there was a philosopher at the University of North Carolina, William Lichen, who suggested that, well, maybe the best way to make sense of a, a dualistic view where um, human beings are bodies plus non-physical souls is to, to say that non-physical souls are, are physically located even though they somehow don't really take up space. Um, so uh, in, in that case you're still, you're still not going to be a case of, of exact location in the same place because the soul would be really small. All right, so, um, but if you think that what's responsible for your psychological life is something physical, then, um, then this seems like it could be a case where you as a person and your body are in the same place at the same time, even though they could be prized apart in special cases, and even though they have different, um, even though, because they have different properties. All right, so um, let me consider an, uh, an objection to this view that you can have two objects in the same place at the same time. And this objection is called the vanishing weight problem. The vanishing weight problem was put forward by, um, it was first mentioned by a philosopher named David Lewis who mentioned it as an aside in one of his books. And then it was fleshed out later by a philosopher named Dean Zimmerman. And the idea goes like this. They said, look, it, thinking about the statue in the lump case, let's imagine that the lump weighs two pounds. Well, in that case, the statue also weighs two pounds. And Lewis and Zimmerman have said, well, if the lump and the statue are not identical, they're two objects and not one, then when we put them on the scale together, we should expect that they will weigh four pounds. But when we put them on the scale together, what happens? They weigh two pounds. And so Lewis and Zimmerman said, because they don't weigh four pounds when weighed together, um, we have some evidence that there's only one object there after all. So here's my response to the vanishing weight problem. When two objects overlap or share parts, their shared parts have a shared weight. So I'd like you to think again about you and your arm. So let's imagine that you weigh 150 pounds. How much does your arm weigh? Well, I asked Google this. I said, Google, how much does an undetached human arm weigh? <laughs> the answer, nine pounds. I might be on an FBI watch list now, I don't know. Um, so you put, so if your arm weighs nine pounds, your body weighs 150 pounds, you step on the scale with your arm attached, what will the scale what will the scale register? 150 pounds. Well, why? Because um, the cells that make up your arm are also the cells that make up part of your body. And because they have a shared, um, shared parts, then 
the arm and the body share weight, and they, we don't we don't add the weight of your body to the weight of your arm. All right, so. Um, My suggestion is that we have the same thing going on in the case of co-location. So in the case of um, uh, two objects being located in the same place at the same time, we have part sharing, just like in the case of you and your arm. But it's, a, it's just a more extreme version of part sharing. So where your arm and your body share, where your arm shares some of the parts with your body, the statue and the lump share all of their parts. And because they share all of their parts, then they share all of their weight. All right, so um, to conclude, two things can exist in the same place at the same time in the following special case. In a special case where those two things are made of the same parts, but have different properties. And we've looked at a couple cases of this. The statue and the lump case is one of these special cases. And a candidate for another case is you and your body. All right, thank you very much for your time.